Okay, you little Welcome to my first YouTube video. My name is Sadie, and I am the autogynocinophile. Okay, divas, well, this is fun. Um, the autogynocinophile. Hello, today... You better work, Thai. Okay. Today I will be reviewing Passages, the eighth feature film by American indie director Ira Sachs. A little history and context on Ira Sachs. He's a gay American filmmaker born in Memphis, Tennessee in 1965. His first film, 1996's The Delta, won Outfest's Outstanding Emerging Talent Award the following year. So Sachs comes from the indie film world, often making small films surrounding themes of queerness, the extent to which we can ever understand another person, legibility, self-discovery, are all recurring themes in his body of work, his oeuvre. Together, Sachs and his husband share co-parenting duties with another filmmaker named... Kirsten Johnson, who bore the children. Their family dynamic is relevant here because it's kind of mirrored within this film. This review does contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, we just know that. Let's jump into a brief synopsis. The film takes place in France. It centers around three main characters. Energetic, like supremely self-absorbed Tomas, played by German actor Franz Rogowski, who my friend Chris described as the epitome of ugly hot. His dutiful and more empathic and relatable husband, Martin, played by British actor Ben Wishaw, and a got an elementary school teacher who the couple becomes involved with, played by French actress Adèle Xercopolis, who is so stunning. You might remember her from Blue is the Warmest Color. So already we have an American director with three leads from three different countries, which is noteworthy because it's a decision that sets the stage for a film largely about communication, misunderstanding, perspective, and again, that idea that someone can even be understood by someone else. So I think it's an interesting artistic creative choice to have sort of people from uh, uh the film opens and we're on like a set within a set so it's tomas who's a film director and he is just like ineptly ruling a film set with an iron fist totally missing the point missing the forest for the trees we immediately get a sense of him as childish and just kind of a prick honestly he like totally lacks the empathy and finesse and subtlety it takes to be a good director and he's basically a dictator not a director so we then see him and his husband martin at a rap party for the film which is also called passages tomas comes up to martin at the bar and he's like can we dance and martin is like being grumpy and doesn't want to. So tomas turns to this woman at the bar who we find out is named a god and he's like it's my party and my husband doesn't want to dance with me. And she just looks at him and is like, I'll dance with you. The two end up dancing all night. They go to an after party together and they <laughs> and it's really hot. The next morning, Tomas comes home and tells Martin that he slept with a woman. Not only that he slept with a woman, but that he wants to talk about the experiences with Martin. The way it goes down in the movie is just like, he's so, Tomas is like so blunt and so, mm clueless. He's totally lacking tact when he brings the subject up. He's basically just like, I slept with a woman and like, I need to talk to you about it. Totally disregarding the idea that Martin might have an emotional reaction to this news. So as the rest of the film unfolds, we got a picture of Tomas as basically a narcissist, which is like a reductive and annoying term, I know, but it's just sort of a simple way to describe him. And Martin is kind of like the good husband, but he's stuck in this toxic dynamic. I got is like very self-assured, well-boundaried woman who's like very adept at fending for herself, but still manages to get swirled into Tomas's like charisma and kind of, they just have this joint chemistry and she's not afraid of it. At the same time, I think she knows she knows what she's getting herself into. Like she's much smarter than him, but she's willing to do it anyway because she's having a good time. So the film follows a love triangle between the three of them with Tomas bouncing back and forth between Martin and Agat, like whenever he doesn't get his way with one of them essentially. So if anything difficult or annoying comes up, 
with one, he runs to the other, almost like a child asking mom for something, and she says no, and then he runs and asks dad for the same thing. The crux of the film is like, will the three characters be able to forge something beautiful and queer and alternative together? Or will they all kind of fall victim to Tomas's whims and compulsions? Getting into it, Passages was like really different from what I expected. I went in expecting like a traditional indie film about messy queer relationships that maybe I'd be doing a lot of cathartic sobbing, a familiar rhythm to the pacing that would feel safe, predictable, and therefore comforting. Did not get that at all, which was great, thankfully. Um, but this film was actually doing something really different and more challenging. The main protagonist, Tomas, is so unlikable. Um, just like he's purely unlikable, and that alone, having an unlikable protagonist in 2023 when the film industry is like geared towards um, very digestible movies and narratives, I think having a protagonist that you basically just don't like is pretty bold. He's pathetic and at moments he's vile and his selfishness has like a relentless pace to it that's almost unbelievable in certain moments like how clueless he is. He's just living from self-interest in such a pure way with zero shame about his actions which has the effect of stirring up a sense of not only disgust within the viewer but more interestingly envy and like even admiration causing us to be simultaneously repulsed by but yet drawn toward Tomas. So it's like kind of like he's behaving in this way that's outside of social norms or expectations so we sort of, we want to hold that at bay, but then we also wish that we could act like him. He says brutal things to the people closest to him without hesitation or seemingly any understanding that he's being a fucking asshole. And his inability to care about other people in a way that's unrelated to his goal of getting his own needs met is kind of his undoing and what ultimately prevents him from getting those needs met. I had basically zero empathy for him until the literal final scene when he's biking and the camera keeps closing in on his face and then it clicked for me that he's both very animalistic, like rodent-like, rodent-brained even. His mind is just scampering everywhere from like base need to base need but yeah, there's something so human in how shielded he is from himself. The level of his self-ignorance makes him like a monstrous composite of someone who is undeniably grotesque, but admittedly and like begrudgingly lovable. And maybe not lovable, but, but beautiful. So another way of saying that could be he's ugly hot. And a note on the cinematography in this last scene, the choice to use long focal lengths and tight framing to hone in on his face and eyes as he like scurries helplessly around the city on his bike helps drive home the idea that he's like spinning out in a cage of his own making, a prison that has sprung out of his like infantile scorched earth policy on relationships. The final frame of passages is a frozen, extreme close-up still of Tomas's eyes and they're like bathed in red light, which to me symbolized the end of the road for his way of living. This behavior that used to serve him is no longer serving him, whether he realizes it or not. It's left ambiguous whether he'll ever learn and grow or if he's just like forever trapped on this love addict hamster wheel. But seeing how trapped he is in the last scene really is like where I empathized with him for the first time. I want to circle back to the very first scene of the film, um, the scene where we see Tomas directing his own film passages. I was looking into the concept of film within a film, and it turns out there's a French phrase for this. It's called, I think I'm pronouncing it right, it's called mise en abîme, mise en abîme, which translates to placed into abyss. The Wikipedia definition says, in Western art history, mise en abîme is a formal technique of placing a copy of an image within itself, often in a way that suggests an infinitely recurring sequence. In film and literary theory, it refers to the technique of inserting a story within a story. This idea of being stuck in an abyss and like an infinitely recurring sequence, almost like a multiverse loop or like Bill Murray and Groundhog Day, is relevant thematically because by the end of the film, we've concluded that like something is broken in Tomas. He is so thoroughly trapped in his pattern that we wonder if he'll ever break out of it. His mode of directing, literally directing, which is to seek total control of those around him, 
reflects his mode of living. And this mode no longer works for him, so he's gonna have to learn a new method. True collaboration, if he wants to cultivate successful, honest, and mutual relationships, that's what he's gonna have to do. Literally at the beginning of the film, he says, to a god, he says, it's my party and my husband doesn't want to dance with me. You know, he's like, <laughs> being a little bitch, basically. But finally, at the end, he's faced with the fact that it's not just his party, girl. Like, <laughs> it's everyone's party. You made this thing together. Like, life is something we do together. And he wants to find a dancing partner, so to speak, he has to become a better dancer. A maybe unintended side effect of Tomas's unflinching carelessness is the humor that it creates in the movie. I laughed out loud a lot, which I hadn't expected because this wasn't billed as a comedy. The humor was kind of off-putting at first, like I wasn't sure if it was intentional. I think I felt by the end that it was like partially intentional, but maybe I was laughing at moments that I wasn't supposed to. But a lot of, a lot of my laughter just came at like seeing how blunt Tomas is and how fucking stupid he is. This guy has like zero fucking communication skills and so much of the drama he finds himself in could have been easily prevented by care, compassion, the ability to listen. A god? Like, <laughs> Adela Sarkopoulos is a goddess. She's like a, one of the most gorgeous women on earth as far as I'm concerned. In such a French way, like her sex appeal is just like through the roof. So to watch her get fumbled by this like complete idiot was so frustrating, but so realistic at the same time. There was also something really touching about her acceptance of Tomas. She's much smarter than him. She's much more secure than him. She's much better looking than him. She's well aware of his shortcomings, but she still chooses to move forward with him. She's a teacher. He's extremely childlike. And that seems relevant. Ultimately, he's less emotionally mature than like her elementary aged students. They have better people skills than he does. In the same way that she's temperamentally equipped to deal with her students, she's also equipped to deal with a man like him. And I want to talk a little more about Adela Sarkopoulos in this role. She is absolutely perfect in this role and she embodies a mixture of childlike play and adult sexuality that's really similar to Tomas's, and they're just kind of like a perfect match. It's almost as if the world is their little sandbox together. Even just physically, both actors have these like childlike features to them. And it got seems to have no tolerance for Tomas's bullshit, which is part of what attracts him to her, I think. Yeah, she's also like extremely willing to indulge him and play and romance with him because she's, again, a three-dimensional adult. She accepts the risks of partnership with this like toxic man. And I think her willingness to engage with him speaks to her own emotional maturity, a maturity that he doesn't have. This kind of sets her apart from Martin, um, Tomas's husband, who I see as more of a victim of Tomas. And he's sort of like more stunted in his growth, I think because he's been with Tomas and he's he's trapped in this dynamic, whereas it got is new to him and has much more agency in general and feels more like securely attached. Sort of is able to brush him off. And it's fun to watch him just kind of like spin out because he can't have what he wants for once. There's a scene where the audience learns that Tomas has gotten and got pregnant, um, basically as a way of like dangling Martin's fantasy life in front of him. It's like, it's so fucked up. It's been hinted at that Martin wants to be a father and maybe like raise a child with multiple parents. So Tomas literally knows this and like uses it to try to get what he wants from both of his lovers. It's nauseating and it's like truly the ultimate manipulation. You could argue that it's sociopathic probably pretty successfully. The treatment of a god is basically like a sex object, a limerent object, like a literal breeder, which is pretty nightmarish. Like imagine like getting a woman pregnant and telling her it's because like you love her and want to start a family but it's like because you're trying to get back at your ex and like start a family with him like that's so that's so evil that's so evil girl so that fucking sucks it's worth noting that by the end of the film she really takes control of herself he's like sobbing at her feet and she's just like this disgusts me like get the fuck away from me she like doesn't enable tomas the way that martin 
does. I wish that the script had given her more interiority and like some more scenes for us to see her background and motivations better. So that felt like a shortcoming of the writing to me. But at the same time, I did feel that it got was a full character and like not just there as a means to an end, like for the male protagonist. And she also comes off as the most likable and authentic of the bunch. So I think that, you know, that definitely works in her favor. So Passages has been deemed by straight people as controversial for its graphic sex scenes. Um, controversial historically being a label that's slapped on gay films or gay media that isn't um, censor, self-censored and like designed to be digested and understood by cis straight audiences. Personally, I was like completely unfazed by the sex scenes in this movie. Like they were really hot. Like I was turned on by them, but I wasn't like, you know, like I am gay. <laughs> I'm gay and I'm no stranger to like fucking other gay people. So as a gay person, I thought it was great. I don't really know like what people are stressed out about. It just seems like typical average gay panic, moral panic. Ira Sachs interestingly has stated in interviews that the film was an action film and that kind of like the isolation of COVID drove him to make something brimming with electric sexuality and intimacy. And you definitely feel that in this film. It does feel kind of like a post-COVID breaking out moment. The quote from Sachs is, I knew that I wanted to make a horny film. <laughs> You better work, Ira Sachs. Because I wanted to turn people on. Because I think that's part of the responsibility of a filmmaker. You're creating a relationship between an image and a spectator. Eros is central to that relationship. I think of this as an action film. It's a film in which bodies combust. And I think that really shows in the final product. Like that sex is the combustion engine that drives the narrative and drives the action and drives these characters and like crashes them into each other so violently. And even the way the story is told and the film is edited, there's no timelines, the pace is very frenetic, the energy is just kind of off the charts. One of the things I love the most about Passages is the way that it just pushed me to my absolute limit with the protagonist and my ability to empathize with him. It forced me to reflect on his worst attributes and behaviors while in no way endorsing those attributes and behaviors. And I think that's an important distinction that contemporary audiences could learn to be better at receiving. Being able to hold nuance, multiple truths, multiple perspectives, being able to live in the gray area of things without feeling that compulsion to escape the messiness of life by like retreating into judgment um, and the laziness and relief of judgment. Because judgment can be the fastest route out of cognitive dissonance, the fastest route to restoring our sense of internal safety when we're feeling internal friction. But I think a much more generative thing can often be to sit with that cognitive dissonance and really allow ourselves to feel what it brings up in us. And I think that can take us to like much deeper places than just being reactive and going straight to judgment. So I like that this film sort of forced me to slow my internal reactions and take a harder look at what's what's going on. I think what's so brave about this film is not the graphic sex scenes, but the way in which it asks us to not like any of its characters, but just witness them. I felt genuinely challenged by this film, and I loved that about it. I wish more contemporary films were this bold and this generous with their audiences, not forcing us into certain corners of understanding. I really, yeah, I really loved that. I really empathized with Adele Xercopolis' character the most in this film, but I did end up feeling like a real genuine sense of tenderness towards all of the characters in spite of their flaws, even sometimes, I think because of their flaws, because it paints such a, a full humanistic portrait of them. So yeah, if you're looking for like a small, subtle, beautifully made film that is not easily digestible and will actually 
challenge you. I really, really recommend Passages. Um, I'm definitely going to be seeing it again. Mm-hmm.